Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the closing session of the second annual Nursing Research and Quality Outcomes Day. My name is Christine Jeffries, and I have the privilege of representing the Shared Nursing Leadership Clinical Improvement and Research Council as we welcome this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Nancy Krigo. Dr. Krigo joins us today from the Duke University School of Nursing, where she serves as an assistant professor. Prior to her faculty appointment at Duke, Dr. Krigo taught at the School of Nursing at Georgetown University, where her innovative teaching methods earned her the appointment as a Teaching, Learning, and Technologies Fellow of the Georgetown University Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship. She earned her PhD in nursing from the University of Virginia, receiving the American Association of Colleges of Nursing Excellent in Advancing Nursing Science Award in 2013 for her dissertation, Factors in Influencing Pediatric Sedation Safety. Her research also garnered her recognition by the Tau chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing with the 2014 Excellence in Nursing Research Award. Her two recent publications in the Journal of Radiologic Nursing and the Journal for Nursing Regulation, she discusses the outcomes of her research, which has brought to light issues of safety in nursing practice relating to sed pediatric sedation and will inform national and state policies on the subject. With a broad clinical background across both pediatric and adult critical care, Dr. Krigo has shared her expertise with many patient care units across the United States, including one of our very own. I'm told she worked here at Children's National on the transport team. For her talk entitled, Pediatric Sedation Research, Practice and Policy, Using the Data to Start a Conversation, please join me in welcoming back to Children's National, Dr. Nancy Krigo. Well, all of that reminds me how old I am. <laughs> basically. So it's really great to be back at um, Children's and actually um, when I was on transport here, a team here, I was um, doing the PhD at UVA and um, some of the things that I thought about really came from being on transport and I think you'll understand that um, as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to be talking about sedation in terms of research in pediatric sedation, practice and policy and using data to sort of start this conversation um, in this area, and there are three main objectives that I wanted to include in the presentation. So besides talking about the actual study and what my findings were in terms of registered nurse sedation, the other two main goals that I had was to talk about um, a little bit about regulation and standards, national standards in pediatric sedation, and what type of evidence avail is available and what we can do to try and improve the evidence that we have for how we regulate and have um, decided to um, sort of try to standardize sedation. And then in addition to that, talk about the use of existing data. So some of the slides that I'm going to show you are ones that I normally wouldn't put in a research presentation, but it's to really show you sort of the way, a good way, or the way that I was able to organize my thoughts on sedation, what the concept of safety is, and how to use data that was available to be able to understand it better. So. Um, so I am going to spend a little bit of time, not much because you're all clinicians, but just so that we make sure we're talking about the same thing. So first, the definition of sedation. So my interest area is in procedural sedation. So I'm not studying sedation of like an intubated patient in the ICU. I'm interested in studying sedation for diagnostic procedures, and it's the administration of agents that may provide analgesia, because sometimes we don't give analgesia, we may just um, want to sedate the patient to help them be comfortable, to try and complete the procedure so that they're cooperative, so we want them to tolerate it, but we don't want it to affect their cardiorespiratory function or to have any additional complications um, because of it. So um, Cote was an anesthesiologist who for many years has um, written in this area, and um, here are some things that we know from early um, earlier research on pediatric sedation, the main points are that definitely we sedate children more than we do adults, um, and there are specific reasons for that, which I think most of us are aware of, that the cognitive and developmental level of the child can make it difficult for them to cooperate for certain procedures that maybe in an adult we would never consider sedating them for, but because we're dealing with children, we may have to do that. 
We also require deeper levels of sedation most of the time because if children are not deeply sedated, they're going to end up moving around. And depending on the type of procedure we're trying to do, that may not be um, um, applicable or may not be helpful because then the imaging study that we're going to do is not going to be very good. Um, we know that because of the amount of sedation that we are now doing, um, and there's also an increasing demand for it, that it is not possible for anesthesia to be able to provide that service to every child. And that because of that, we now have um, an environment where there are a lot of non-anesthesia sedation providers with varying backgrounds and that there's a variation in how sedation is done um, just based on, on that. So a little bit about um, our past and our present. So around the late 1980s um, is when there started to be these reports about um, deaths and other complications associated with sedation. So at that point in time, again, Charles Cote was very much involved in this. And so he um, did an article in which he investigated um, the deaths that were occurring in um, dental procedures associated with sedation. And there was a, a group, a number that sort of happened all in a, a relatively short period of time. And so what he looked at was just the records of those patients that um, died um, from the sedation um, that were children. And the main points that he came out, which um, are still valid today, uh, he identified problems of monitoring. At that point, there were practices like administering the medication that parents would do it at home, and then they would come to have the dental procedure done. Um, things like um, the provider really not having specific training and that there were no really specific standards about office-based sedation at that point in time. So things at this point, they're like pulse oximetry was relatively a new thing. So you didn't see that. Um, you know, just all over the place. And ambulatory care also was becoming more popular. So um, there's definitely some things that have happened in our past that have made us really think about the safety of sedation. But unfortunately, this, this is a headline from USA Today. This is January 2014. And it, again, reports another death of a child um, that happened um, at a dentist's office associated with sedation. So these, these things continue to occur. So um, let's talk about a little bit about what we know about pediatric sedation safety and some of the adverse events. So in the past, most of the um, studies that have been done associated with sedation have been single sites, and they have used sometimes a few thousand patient cases. Sometimes it's been cases just in the hundreds. And so because of that, we have this wide range of you know, um, estimated frequency of events. So sometimes you'll see 0.4 to 20 percent. And one, some of the reasons why that happened is because, first of all, you need to have a pretty large number of patient cases to really be able to see whether or not an adverse is, a ha event is happening in sedation. We know this from surgery, right? So it's not a very common problem. So you need to have a lot of cases before you can say, oh, you know, we really didn't see any adverse events. So you have to have some cases in the thousands, basically, to be able to do it. The other problem that was occurring at that point in time is that, and I'm just using the example of desaturation, common adverse events had different definitions. So you would look at one study and they would say, well, desaturation, we would we'll count things like kids that desaturate down to 90 percent. Um, you know, after 45 seconds. And then you'd look at somebody else's study and they were like, no, the moment that they desaturate below 95%, we'll count that as an adverse event. And somebody else would write something else. So it was very difficult to really know, well, what are we actually measuring? And there's no comparison that you could make because everybody had different definitions of what adverse events were. So then around 2006, Cravero and his um, group, um, they're at Dartmouth, they started the Pediatric Sedation Research Consortium, and it started out as a grant from AHRQ. And what they wanted to do was develop basically a data set, a large data set that would um, involve multiple sites where everybody would collect data on one web-based tool and where the data that was collected all had the same definition. So that when we said adverse events and did said desaturation, it was clear that everybody was collecting the same thing. 
Um, so the way that the data set was developed was through a consensus method. It was an interdisciplinary meeting in which there were people from anesthesia, people from nursing, people from dentistry, just about any subspecialty that you could think of that looked at evidence and in addition to that, sat and really started to think about what are the major things that we really need to know about sedation, how are we going to measure that, and how are we going to collect that information? And so that is what how the Pediatric Sedation Research Consortium started. And as we go a little bit further in the presentation, I have some copies of what the web-based tool looks like and also um, what the code book looks like so you can understand what I'm talking about. So when he did his first um, publication on this, it was the first time there was a very large multi-site study. Um, at this point, the consortium had about 35 organizations that were contributing data to it. And this was, this amount of cases was collected in the first year. So this was between around um, 2005 to 2006. So there were 30,000, 37 sedation cases he reported on. Um, and the overall adverse event rate was 5.3%. Um, and that was the first time that we really had a sense of what an adverse event rate would uh, normally be. The other thing that I think is important that gets lost is the individual patient and family needs. Now, this is a very um, important person to me. So um, JJ was a um, the son of a former colleague, one of my mentors, in the PICU, and he was born with a congenital brain tumor. And so throughout his life, he had multiple times where he had to have all kinds of procedures, multiple sedations for different kinds of things. And I think when we think about sedation, we have the tendency to just think about it as this one event. But for many children, it isn't one event. It's multiple events over time. And we know very little about what that is like for the families and for, for children. And so he really was um, had a lot to do with my interest in finding out more about sedation. So now this is a little bit more about just, just nurse sedation research and what we know um, or used to know. So basically, for nurse sedation research, most of the studies that have been done have really reported practices based on the location where people practice. They're usually small studies, often with just hundreds of cases. And the areas have been things like radiology um, or, uh, let's say, sedation that nurses provide for dressing changes in burn units um, or for endoscopy or orthopedic procedures. So there haven't been a lot of studies that looked at multiple sites or really large numbers. So you really couldn't get a good sense of what the adverse event rate was there either because of that. And often the studies also focused on what medication was administered. So, you know, how many times did the nurse give chloral hydrate and what were the effects of that? And, um, and then you'd have another one comparing, well, chloral hydrate versus midazolam. So there's, there's tons of those kinds of studies but again, with a very small uh, sample size. And then also, you have that same prob problem about outcome measure, different adverse event definitions, um, a really large, lots of focus on sedation time, because of course, for us, workload and you know the number of patients that we're sedating is something that's relevant. So sedation time was a big thing um, that was reported in most of those studies. But it really didn't help us understand overall you know, how, what is happening with nurse sedation. Other things that um, we know about sedation now is that we do it in a lot of locations. So depending on where you're doing it, there are different things that we have to deal with. So when you're an MRI doing sedation, that's very different than doing sedation, you know, for an endoscopy because there's equipment issues, it's difficult to see the patient, the patient absolutely can't be moving because you're not going to get a good image. It's a little bit different than when you're doing, let's say, a bone marrow kind of sedation where that, you know, you know it's much shorter. Um, so again, there's different types of procedures. So nurses were being asked to do sometimes moderate or sometimes deep sedation. Um, there's different types of providers. They have different levels of experience. Um, and then there's the patient who has different levels of morbidity, comorbidities. Um, ASA scores um, are commonly used to try and assess risk in sedation. And there's a wide variety of levels there of patients that we take care of. And then this was also a huge issue over time, the number of medications that are available for us to choose from has really risen drastically. Um, so all of those things have increased the amount of complexity that there is associated with sedation. So let's talk a little bit about what we've tried to do as a profession to try and assure that sedation is safe. So there are three main areas that um, 
we have worked on, basically. So the first one are national standards. So national nursing standards are developed by specialty organizations, and they usually address specific issues. So when you go to, let's say, the um, AACN, American Association of Critical Care Nurses, you can find everything associated with what is competent care, standards of care for the ICU. And we have the same thing for the ED, and we have the same thing for radiology. But sedation happens in all of those places. So there is no one really overarching organization that has provided one standard for nursing. There are some for um, physician specialties, but not for nursing specifically. Um, so the problem with that is that a lot of times they're very conflicting. So what the guidelines are, what the standards are for different organizations will sometimes vary. And sometimes they won't address, let, for example, deep sedation. They'll only talk about moderate sedation. And also there's not a lot of evidence to try and support what the guidelines are. The next um, what I want to talk about are organizational policies. So policies, obviously, for nurses, it's really important that we're aware for our particular organization what the policy is. So the competency standards we know because of joint commission that there are minimum standards, so we at least have some sense that there has to be some level of competence and training, and we know that there are certain things like monitoring standards that have been addressed by the joint commission, so organizational policies have to follow that. But other than that, there's a wide variety in how organizations decide to deliver sedation. Are we doing just a sedation team? Is there a sedation team that goes to different units? Is only anesthesia doing sedation? It varies by where we are. Um, the other person or, er or organization that's caught in the middle is the Board of Nursing. So as you know, the Board of Nursing, um, we don't have one set of regulations. It's based on the individual state. And if you go to different states, which is what happened to me on transport, they all have different sedation rules and scope of practice that you do depending on where you are. So being here, where we sometimes would be in Maryland, sometimes DC, sometimes in Virginia, sometimes in Pennsylvania, there were different standards and requirements for us to be giving sedation in that state. Um, which is, so it really made me think about this, this whole idea um, so the way that the Board of Nursing functions, their main mission is to protect the public. And then they, they institute practices based on laws that are individual to the state. They can discipline us, um, but most of their standards are based on whatever the national standards are. So they are not really a body that makes standards. They wait for other um, professional organizations to provide the standards, and then they use them to develop the regulations. Okay. Um, and then this last point about the organization, I think I already talked about that. Each of us has sort of a different way. So let's look at some of the national nursing practice standards. So um, I divided it up into three categories, but there are different categories that you could probably use. So we have one set of standards that, for example, prohibit deep sedation by an RN. And those are, um, these are two of them, but there are more. So American Society of Anesthesiologists is one, and American Association of Nurse Anesthetists is another one. Then you have the groups that are supporting and administering deep sedation. So American Nurses Association, there's a consensus statement. I only listed about five of the groups that um, signed on to that one, but there's actually about 10 groups, including the Transport Nurses Association, that use this as their standard for providing sedation. And then also the Colleges of Gastroenterology and Society for Gastroenterology and Endoscopy also endorse it. And then you have other places that give no guidance. So for example, the Joint Commission talks about what are the minimum standards for a provider, but it never says, okay, but for a nurse, this is what's required or this is what should or shouldn't be allowed. Okay, so the reason that I put this on here, um, this is one of those slides that I normally wouldn't put on for a research presentation, but this is from Murphy, who uh, published this in 2013. And what Murphy tried to do, bravely, she tried to go and talk about the whole issue of credentialing registered nurses for moderate sedation. So she tried to get from each individual state the statement and the links to be able to find out what do you need to do, like what is the regulation associated with moderate sedation only, for each of these individual states. She did it for all 50. So just by looking at this, you can see here, some of them have no statement, advisory opinion, position statement, no statement, 
Uh, here's one where Idaho has it under frequently asked questions. Illinois has an administrative code. I mean, there's a wide variation in this. And I can tell you, because I just um, sort of use this as a springboard to do an additional study about um, deep sedation, that now some of these have changed already. So these are constantly changing. So this is from um, this review that I did. It just got published this month, and it's in the Journal of Nursing Regulation. And what I tried to do was also find out about some other questions that we have related to propofol and deep sedation, and there's no way that I could do all 50 states. What I did was take just a sample from different um, demographic areas using the U.S. Bureau, the Census Bureau. And again, you can see similar kinds of things where you have where the nurse may not administer it. In Wisconsin, you have to have um, an institutional policy and then here there's another one, there's a deep sedation guideline in Massachusetts that the organization has to develop. So again, there's a lot of different um, regulations associated with it, but nothing is unified. I moved to North Carolina in November. I just got there. Um, I just um, started at Duke, and wouldn't you know that they called me from the Board of Nursing because in January they just redid their statement related to sedation, and this is literally just published in April of this um, year. So they did actually address deep sedation and moderate sedation and have addressed that for a moderate sedation, the person that's a physician CRNA, MP or PA has to be um, in the procedure area immediately available. They did not restrict deep sedation um, administered by the nurse, but there has to be a physician CRNA, MP or PA that's physically present at the bedside. So that's what they've um, decided to do. So. Um, that's definitely difficult when you're trying to understand um, sedation in the United States when you have all of these different types of standards. Then the sedation standards that um, have we have agreed upon are certain things we have agreed upon. Definitely the definition, so the ASA definitions of moderate sedation and deep sedation, everyone has pretty much unified on that. And then the Joint Commission, you know, most of our policies basically meet those. But again, remember that they don't specifically state what the level of the provider is that can do either one of those. So I decided to do this research study where I really wanted to find out about registered nurse sedation practices. I excluded CRNAs. I excluded anybody who was advanced practice because I just wanted to know about bedside nurses. I wanted to know about the patients that they were sedating, what medications they were giving, what are their monitoring practices, what kinds of outcomes they had. Um, and so I chose to use um, patients that are an MRI, CT scan, and ultrasound. And I purposely only chose diagnostic and non-interventional. And the reason that I did that is because I didn't want the added variation that would happen when you would have somebody who has an interventional procedure where there are other medications like analgesia that we have to give or other problems can, that could be associated with it. So that was the first thing, just it was primarily descriptive. And then the second thing I really wanted to know is what is the difference between the types of providers? So essentially when you look at most standards on sedation, the gold standard is it's a nurse and physician team and that's sort of what they assume, but it's not always like that. We know that sometimes nurses are doing sedation, you know, pretty much on their own, um, depending on, on what the situation is. So I wanted to know about differences between physicians and nurse teams, but I didn't, my, my impression was the person I really wanted to compare ourselves to were non-anesthesia providers, okay? So I did not include any anesthesiologists or CRNAs in the study either because we're just talking about non-anesthesiology providers. So all of the comparisons are done that way. So this, I decided to use the health services research methodology using that pediatric sedation research consortium um, database. So by the time that I got to it, there were about 30 organizations that were um, collecting data and it includes children's hospitals, hospitals uh, within hospitals. There were two international sites at that point. And the way that it works is basically um, when you agree to be in it, there is one primary investigator for, per institution. There's an IRB protocol that um, has to be, ha they have to go through. Um, they purposefully only collect de-identified data. So I don't have data on um, anything like address or zip code, anything like that. 
And the reason that they did that is because they really wanted it to be easy for members to then be able to use that information to really assess and evaluate the quality of their own sedation program. Um, and so that's why there is no um, identifying information um, on there. Um, the primary investigator oversees the data collection in that particular site. And the main goal of the consortium is not to get like as much sedation data on any type of sedation in a particular hospital. They would rather have each site collect either in one or two specific areas where they knew that they would be able to really get good in-depth knowledge of that particular area. So most of the institutions will either collect maybe one or in two places at the most. So they're not collecting sedation data on every single sedation within their institution. They have to do an audit to assure that a minimum of 90% of the cases in the location that they selected are being reported so that people aren't you know, deciding not to include you know, like that one bad sedation case that they had. Um, and the other really great and really helpful thing for me is that one of the data points was who is actually administering the drug and who is actually in the room monitoring at the time that the patient has been sedated. So for me, those were really um, important um, areas. So um, the sedation consortium has sort of um, evolved over time. You can still go to this site and you'll see, and I actually have it on here, so I'll go to it in a moment, um, the original IRB protocols, the web tool that's used and you can actually see the data points that are collected. And then now if you go to this site, um, here's the consortium information and there's a link that you can go to that lists all of the member institutions because those do change over time. So I am going to open the data collection tool real quick so you can see what that looks like. Okay. So this is basically what it looks like. So when the sedation is done, um, it's done prospectively, so not retrospectively. The, there's a person, usually at most sites, there's one person that's been designated as the person to input the information. Most of the time it is a nurse. And so what they will do is, through this web-based tool, go through and through a series of, of um, drop-down menus, provide information on that particular sedation. So it tells you exactly you know, like when you're putting in age, that it's age and years. And then it'll have automatically coded, what is the ASA score? So you would select which one of these was um, written. And it goes on and on. So this whole document is, what, like about, um, probably about 20, 38 pages long. So there's a tremendous amount of data that could potentially be collected, but it's not being collected on every single patient, meaning that, you know, if you had a patient who had MRI, you're going to sit there and click on radiology procedures. They're not going to ask you about, like, bone marrow procedures because you're not doing those. So most of the time, most of those sites have said that after getting some experience with it, it takes approximately a 15-minute period of time to get the, the data in. Okay, so the first part of my study was literally I just wanted to describe, you know, like what are nurses doing in radiology. So um, this is a commonly used um, sort of table that you'll see with any health services research type of data where it tells you exactly what was included in the number of the patients. So when I first received the data, which I only requested um, data that met this criteria, so from January 2005 to September 2007, I included children up to and including age 14, MRI, CT, or ultrasound. Um, so I started out with 41,392 cases. And then from there, I only wanted it where there was an ASA score. So you can see there were 110 that I lost that way. Only cases where both the nurse was the person delivering sedation and monitoring sedation, and nobody else was doing that. So there were cases where the nurse and the physician were monitoring or where the nurse and physician both administered meds, they are not included in, in this part of the study. Um, I only wanted the cases where it was only the RN monitoring and only the RN delivering the sedative. And then along here you can see that I divided up the cases into the different types of medications and what is included underneath there. So for opioids, anesthetics, non-opioids. 
So when I ended up with the sample, I ended up with 12,584 cases of nurses that, or cases that met that criteria of just the nurses. So what I'm gonna present now is just the descriptive part. So we could spend tons of time on the data, um, but what I wanted to highlight were some of the major points in my, um, in this study, definitely MRI was the most common procedure that was done. To me, one area of interest was knowing whether or not the depth of sedation that they planned was the actual level of sedation that the patient achieved. And you can see that moderate and deep were the most common planned levels of sedation, and most of the time, that is what was achieved. The total number of adverse events were 727, so that's 5.78% adverse events, which is somewhat similar to that Cravera study that I talked about before, which also used the same data set. So the same adverse event definitions, the same criteria are the same ones for this. So you can compare the two studies because of that. Um, and then here are the adverse, adverse events by category. I don't think anyone's surprised that respiratory complications are the most common ones. And then the next one were neurological complications. I was also interested in what the practices were. So one of the things that I wanted to see were the number of medications per case. This has been commonly described in previous literature as being um, a source for increased risk. So what I did was divide up my cases so that I would know patients that only got one med versus two meds versus three meds. So you can see that um, most of our patients got one to two medications. There were very few that got three or four drugs. The one thing that I wasn't able to do that I really wanted to do was try and look at just the categories of drugs. So in other words, like how many patients got opioids and then what was the, you know, like what was the monitoring that was done, for example. What I didn't expect was the immense number of combinations of drugs. I ended up not being able to do it by category. So these are the most common combinations of medications that the nurses gave. So midazolam and pentobarb, that was not a surprise to me. There were 3,500, 3,572 cases where that was the medication combination that was used. I do have to say I was a little surprised by the use of fentanyl um, because none of these procedures are interventional. They're purely diagnostic. There was no intervention done. Um, and then there were some cases of midazolam and ketamine. And then I was able to also look at non-sedative medications. My main thing was, you know, did they have a lot of reversal? So you can see they had to reverse once with lamazenil, once with naloxone. And um, basically, they, Robinol was the main drug that they were using that was a non-opioid or non-sedative medication. So then what I wanted to do was, after seeing that, it's like, okay, so like, what does that mean? Because I don't have any comparison data. Well, the comparison data that I was able to use was the data by Crevero, because Crevero had published on those 30,000 patients that um, were sedated by physicians using the identical adverse events and the identical criteria. So some of the things of interest in the light gray are the RN only. So these are the cases in which only nurses did the sedation, monitoring and administering, and not any physicians um, or any other providers were doing it. So, you, And the darker one is from Provero's study. So you can see that in terms of ASA 1, 2, and 3, they're very similar um, frequencies in the type of, um, of those patients that, um, that we sedated. The big difference was in ASA 1E, which is the emergency category, which makes sense that the physician providers were the ones who were most likely going to have this level of patients. I was able to do the same thing with medications, and this was really interesting to me also. So you can see that the main drugs that we as nurses used when just looking at just um, one single drug at a time, pentobarb, chloral hydrate, and midazolam. Here is the propofol use, but that's in the physician group. We had almost zero that were nurses administering um, propofol on their own. And then I also looked at unexpected um, adverse events. So when we look at unexpected adverse events, it's usually done in a per 10,000 cases. That's the sort of the, um, the way that they're reported. So for nurses, again, we're the light gray, and then Provero's group is the darker gray, which is the physician group. So prolonged sedation was um, more common in our group. And then here's inadequate sedation agitation. So this was also pretty common in the nursing group. 
I also specifically wanted to look at three areas that we've hotly debated a lot in the Pediatric Sedation Consortium and they're desaturation, vomiting, and wheezing. So for the consortium purposes, desaturation is um, a saturation of less than 90% for more than 30 seconds. If they reach that, that's considered an, um, an adverse event. So you can see there's a lot of similarities between both the Crevero study and um, the RN only study. Um, and then the same thing well, with vomiting, this is non-GI vomiting. So these are patients that had no GI complaints and then as an adverse event, probably from the medication, went ahead and, and had vomiting. So that was um, more common in our group. And then wheezing, it was almost, um, it wasn't really that um, significant. But I was most interested in those three particular adverse events. Okay, now another thing that I was able to compare was what types of monitoring devices we used. So Langen in 2012 did a study in which he evaluated, again, using the Sedation Research Consortium database, what pieces of equipment were being used while we were monitoring sedation. And he did it by procedure. Okay, so, um, so in the light gray on the top, these are MRI. So darker gray are any radiology procedure that wasn't MRI. And then here is the nursing group. So there you can see things like a low rate for nursing to be using ECG. ETCO2 was another one that was somewhat low. You can see pulse oximetry, just about everybody um, is using that. So that was no surprise. And blood pressure monitoring also, our use of it was a little bit lower. But that could also be associated with the types of drugs that we're giving, things like chloral hydrate, which frequently we may not do um, as much as the monitoring for. So that just pretty much told me just descriptively about what nurses were doing in radiology. But the other part that I really wanted to know was, okay, so like how different is that when a nurse alone does sedation versus when it's a physician and nurse team doing sedation? So um, so I went back and did a further analysis. When I did this, I was categorizing the cases into three possible types of cases. So RN only, which we talked about, so only the nurse was monitoring and delivering the sedative. Um, so there were 12,564 cases of that. RN and medical team, any combination in which the nurse and a physician were doing either monitoring or delivering of the um, medication was in this group. So there are 22,000 of those. And then this was a small group of only physicians, physicians monitoring and delivering. Again, no CRNAs are in this group. There's no anesthesiologist in this or CRNAs or um, advanced practice people. Okay, so there is so much data and this became so complex that to do this, I really had to start thinking about, okay, so what exactly are the important components of, of sedation and safety? And this really goes a lot with what Jeff was talking about. Um, so I ended up using this um, conceptual model. It's called the SEEPS model. So it's a systems engineering patient safety model. And what it basically says is there are three components to safety, work system, process, and outcome, which is a well-known sort of theory. And then in addition to that, that there are three parts that go to that. So for work system, right underneath that, that includes the person, which is the provider, as well as the patient that has something to do with the amount of safety that's going to be involved. The environment, what the tasks are that are completed, what the technologies are that we're using, and the organization. Based on that, there's a process that happens, whatever our policy or process is for sedation. And then there's an outcome that happens from that. And then there should be a feedback loop based on how we evaluate the outcome that can have an effect on this. So that was the sort of conceptual way to think about, for me, for um, safe sedation care. So what I did was then take all of those elements from that massive 38-page you know, data um, code book and really think about how do they relate to these individual items, the work system, the care process, and the outcome. And so I was able to identify patient risk factors, provider type risk factors, technologies, all the ones that are underlined are variables inside of my study. The ones that I could not include, unfortunately, organization, because remember I told you that the data is de-identified. I don't know which of the 35 organizations it's coming from. I can't tell you anything about it. I don't know if it's a children's hospital, a hospital within a hospital, 
so I don't have that information, so I couldn't include it. And then the task and environment, this is about organizational policy. So that one I felt that, yeah, I don't know about the individual organizational policy, but I know what some of the minimal joint commission policies are. I mean, we have some sense of that. But I was not able to put any specific variables on that. Okay, so here's one of those slides that I would normally not put in here, but that I only included so that you could, again, see sort of how to think about using data. So at the very top, right here, this is my work system, and these are all the individual variables that I included that would consist of work system. So it's really sitting there thinking about what's the data that you have, what's the most important part to use, and how can you collapse it down so that it makes sense when you get the results. So the things I included were ASA scores, coexisting conditions, and what I ended up having to do, like for example, for coexisting conditions, I know that there were, let's see, 1, 000, 2,398 kids that had some sort of GI problem, but do I really think that that individual item is going to make a difference? Well, probably not. The important thing is you know, that I know that kids that have no comorbidity versus kids that have one or two comorbidities, those are more likely to make a difference. So I was able to collapse those variables down from this. And that's essentially what ends up happening when you have this large amount of data that you're trying to work with. Then for work system, here it talks about what the provider type was, which I already um, let you know. And then also the different technologies. Um, now, an, unexpected thing that happened was I had CT scan only patients, MR only patients, and ultrasound only patients. What ended up happening was that if you had an MRI, that, mean, that meant like with a 99% confidence that you didn't have a CT scan. And if you had a CT scan, you could be 99% sure that you weren't going to have an MRI. So there's no point in using both sets of data. So I included um, only MRI in the actual final um, data, okay? And then the variables, what I wanted to know was about adverse events. So there are two ways that I was able to do that. So the first one was any type of adverse event. So either you had one or you didn't. So I tried to uh, predict that. And then the other ones were the different types of events. So things like neurological adverse events, these are the things that are already in the data set that are included in that category of neurological adverse events. So I could go back and sort of see, um, see that. Okay, so what I did was hierarchical logistic regression, which is basically modeling different types of items to determine how much of an effect they have on an adverse event. So what I did was the age and month, the procedure, number of medications, monitoring, and then my last one, which is the main one that I'm interested in, is the provider type. So RN only, MD only, and MD and RN. So when you do this, what you're trying to find out is basically a comparison. So in the cases that had only the nurses given the sedation and monitoring the sedation, how did they do in comparison to the MD and RN group? Okay, so that's basically what tried to find. So this is what I found. So this is basically just any adverse event, and I only included the ones that were significant. All of these were significant at the 0 .0001 level of significance. So the two main things, any time that there was a crit case where there were greater than two medications that were administered, there was a six-fold increase in the number of adverse events with those patients. Um, the other Significant um, one, when you look here at RN only provider and MD only provider, the RN only provider and the MD only provider each had significantly lower adverse events rates than the MD and RN team working together. I thought maybe propofol would have something to do with it because there was a large number of patients that received propofol that were not in the nurse group. So I did an additional model controlling for propofol, which is right next to this, and you can see that there is very little difference in the outcome of that model. Then I went ahead and I looked at any adverse event rates. This is just a summary. So there were 2,164 total adverse event rates. And um, here are the things that I controlled for. And 
what I just said, basically the difference between MD and RN only versus MD RN team. Then I looked at the individual adverse events, just neurologic, just um, respiratory, just emergent condition. And I don't have the whole chart because I knew I was going to be low on time. But again, cases where there were two meds administered or more than two meds administered in those cases had um, significantly higher odds of an adverse event. And cases that the RN had lower odds, so um, were neurological adverse events and emergent events. There was no difference between MD and RN teams and RN only providers for respiratory events. Okay, so in summary, we had a lot of similarities. There were some major differences in some of our monitoring practices. Um, and there were definitely some differences between RN and MD teams versus just RNs that were only providing sedation. So some of the recommendations based on this are about having a little bit more collaboration at the National um, Council of State Boards of Nursing. The NCSBN is basically sort of like the umbrella organization for all boards of nursing. They have no enforcement or any sort of power other than the power of influencing. So um, they have recently um, started to, I think, become more aware of the need to have more standard um, guidance. So recently, and I'm going ahead here, um, they just got certified um, by the American National Standards Institute to be able to begin to develop standards. When they do that, though, all they can do is act as an influencer. There's no, they can't cause or make boards of nursing follow what their guidance is. Um, and then also really having a better amount of evidence. I only presented for radiology and only peds. I don't know anything about adult sedation with nurses and I still don't, and I haven't done any further studies for other areas, although I plan to. Also, this is the best site that I can get to to try and find information about sedation policies and regulations in the Board of Nursing. It's through these links that, um, through a private group, that basically try and sell you their certification services. Um, and it's never up to date, so it's very unreliable. So I think that's another area that we really need to do a better job. Um, we should, based on the, this one study, definitely maintaining guidelines about monitoring. Um, and then also with ASA scores, I think that we're at the right place with thinking about nurses providing just to ASA 1 and 2 patients, so that um, seems like it's pretty safe. And then um, really talking, continuing to emphasize competency in airway management, um, because that was definitely the most common problem that we saw. Um, and then also really thinking about how we can all use that sedation research consortium data or other data that we have available to us within each of our organizations to really understand things like competencies and um, equipment use and things of that nature. So these are some future ideas for what I would like to do. Uh, I'd like to collect more data on adults. I'd like to um, try and find out more information about organization. I think that's extremely important and it's missing in this data. And then I really want to go back and get primary data on the difference be differences between RN and MD teams versus RN poll. Okay, and here are some of the limitations. I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to rush through those. Acknowledgements, I did receive um, NRSA grant to complete this study. And then also I want to acknowledge members of my dissertation committee as well as the additional statisticians that also were involved in the study. And all the references are listed here. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Credo for, Credo, for your informative talk. I was especially inspired by how your clinical experiences informed the direction and depth of your research. Um, and very appreciative, especially I'm an operating room nurse, so this is really wonderful to hear your talk. Um, we are going to continue the closing session now with an interdisciplinary response and discussion of clinical realities of sedation practice here at Children's National featuring four distinguished clinicians with us today. Please allow me to introduce 
Dr. Richard Kaplan, Chief of the Division of Anesthesiology, Sedation, and Perioperative Medicine at Children's National Medical Center. He is a professor of anesthesiology and pediatrics at Children's National, as well as at the George Washington University Medical Center. Dr. Kaplan earned his medical degree from the State University of New York at Syracuse. He completed his residency in anesthesia at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and completed two pediatric anesthesia fellowships at Mass General and at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Keep going. <laughs> many, many acknowledgments. <laughs> um, and I do want to note, Dr. Kaplan graciously reorganized his operating room schedule to be with us today, so thank you. <laughs> Also welcoming um, Kristen Lajeda. She is an anesthesia nurse at Children's National as well as the coordinator of the non-operating room anesthesia program. Um, after graduating from Kent State University, she worked at Children's National as a post-operative anesthesia care unit nurse for six years before joining the anesthesia department. Kristen currently serves as the leader of the sedation committee. Sylvia Simke has worked at Children's National as a crisis nurse for 20 years innovating that role following five years of critical care at Children's as well as experience in adult and pediatric trauma. Her role, in her role as crisis nurse, Sylvia responds to trauma and medical alerts, assists with in-house transport of critically ill patients, discovers, I mean, sorry, recovers patients from non-OR anesthesia, and coordinates care for complex MRI patients in both critical and acute care areas. She also performs sedation for and assists providers with procedures and tests such as lumbar punctures and CT scans. And Pamela Christensen is the interventional radiology nurse at Children's National, joining our team in 2012 following nine years at St. Louis Children's Hospital in the pediatric ICU. She's collaborated with interdiscipl interdisciplinary teams at Children's National to change policy and expand nursing sedation practice within the radiology department. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. And Dr. Credo. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, why don't, may I, why don't we start with questions? So do people have questions or comments? I have the mic if anybody. <laughs> do we have, this is Elaine Williams, hi, do we have an RN only um, station nurse for a, a children? I mean, that's there probably was an the example. crisis nurses, yeah. So under what circumstance would you, like what case would that be? Um, we get calls from the physicians when there's um, a patient that needs sedation for something like uh, LP on the neuro floor or um, sometimes evoke responses, tests, and sometimes taking the inpatients down to radiology like in the evening or weekends when there's not the radiology nurses there. So a lot of different scenarios. With you. They would have to do the ordering and sometimes we help them kind of consider what, how to manage it because it might be a resident that starts the process and then we talk with the fellows and higher ups and, and decide, you know, assessing the patient if they would need an anesthesia consult instead and kind of get the background about the patient. From the I, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I understand that, but what about the physician RN team? That that I didn't understand. It seems like it's the same combination. So, so for my study, the physician was literally there in the room for the time either delivering the medication or monitoring, but there are some situations where the physician may have ordered the medication, but they may not be there with you. And like for interventional radiology, my physician orders the medications that he's doing the procedure, be it the PICC line, the biopsy, whatever. So I or my team are solely responsible for pushing the medication 
monitoring and then intervening if needed. So he's in the room, but it is solely the nurse purview to monitor and care for that child. Right. So that would be an example. For my purposes, that would be an MDRN team. And for us, if we were doing the LPs, the physician doing it, we don't have many LIPs, nurses doing that. So that would be physician nurse. But if it was taking a patient from their room down to radiology, then it would be two nurses going. And if that was your example of an RNMD, mm -hmm. in radiology and other areas, like if they're having a DMSA study or a CT study, um, there is a physician in the area immediately available, but they are not in the room with the nurse. It is the nurse and the patient doing the DMSA study. But I think the question brings up the point that really these definitions become very, they overlap so much. And how does one fit in? And what are the clear definitions? What are the, the definitions by the various boards as to what a physician does, what a nurse does, what's the scope of practice? And as was pointed out, that there's a tremendous amount of overlap and kind of confusion from from the highest levels as to what person can or cannot do. So it's it's hard to define these. Uh, and is the doc really there or is he hiding in a corner in a room somewhere and he just ordered it and, you, and you're, the nurses are the ones doing everything? Are they in the room? Are they immediately available? Is it a team or is it really not so much of a team? Uh, we, we have tried to take on a very aggressive approach here where we, we really do have a team approach. And my uh, a humble opinion, deep sedation is riskier than general anesthesia. Why is that? Because the child may or may not have lost the airway. The child's not in control of the airway. You're not in control of the airway. There's no endotracheal tube in control of the airway. So here we sit in Never Never Land. So um, sedation, especially deep sedation, can be very, very challenging. I think if I could go into a little soliloquy, if you guys bear with me, some comments on, on the very nice presentation that was made is that the overarching role is safety. What, what What's driving this thing is, is safety. Not really who gives it, uh, but are we doing it well and have we created a safety net such that kids don't fall through the safety net? And I think the study showing both from nurse and MDs giving sedation that it really is remarkably safe, thank goodness. So I think we should all feel pretty good that we've created a safety net. Can we make it better? Should we make it better? Absolutely. Every place seems to do it differently, and that's because it has to come from homegrown places. It has to be what your institution has available, what training they have, what resources they have, what equipment they have, and that has to drive this because every place truly is different. So the consortium, which is now well over 35 institutions, and we are not a member of the consortium for other political type reasons, but the consortium is a group of very highly motivated sub uh, institutions which really do sedation right. So you're seeing data from the best of the best institutions, which is important to know, but it's very hard to generalize this to a small community hospital where maybe they don't have the resources training to do it. So, so one has to be careful how they use any sort of data because it really is homegrown. I think as was pointed out very appropriately is the scope of practice that of the nurse is an important part of this thing and the scope of practice varies by where you are, whether you're in Maryland, D.C., in Texas, and there are differences. And therefore, what is the nurse supposed to do? Who do they listen to? Are they going to put their their license on the line, uh, taking care of a person or administering a drug while in reality the Board of Nurses says you cannot administer propofol? Um, what if it's given by an IV drip? So you're in the intensive care unit and the propofol is being given and you're you're there. Are you administering the propofol? No one else is around. Or are you monitoring the propofol? So even the definitions of, of what it means to administer versus monitor become very murky and are not very well defined by any of the of the boards, really, in my opinion, if they define it, they they define it differently. Uh, there's also a definition, a term called procedural sedation. So to add interest to the mix that certain groups have defined sedation under mild sedation, moderate sedation, deep sedation, and anesthesia, while other organizations use the concept procedural sedation, which definitions overlap the definitions of moderate and mild sedation. So it does become 
very, very challenging to really make heads or tails of this when you're on the front line, when you're the nurse trying to take care or the doc and you're trying to take care of these patients. What exactly is the sedation level and what is your scope of practice and what can or, or can't you do? Um, I think what was also pointed out very importantly is painful procedures versus non-painful procedures. And they are totally different ball games. And in order to do a painful procedure on a five-year-old child who is barely holding it together, once you start hurting them, you have to basically give deep sedation or else you're going to tie the kid down. And a lot of the sedation failures are not sedation failures because of deep sedation and airway problems. They're sedation failures because the child basically is screaming and crying and you can't get the procedure done. That's a sedation failure. But think of the trauma that you put this child through and they're going to, usually they're frequent flyers and they need multiple bone marrows or whatever and therefore they're going to remember that. So it really is important. On one hand, you don't want to hurt the airway so you want to give a little less. On the other hand, if you give too little, you're going to have a post-traumatic stress syndrome which truly occurs uh, in children. Um, and then uh, one of the things, uh, you mentioned medications and you mentioned ketamine and propofol. One of the things that the nurses here should be very proud of, and Kathy Sheehy in particular, was pushing through ketamine, uh, the use of ketamine outside of the intensive care unit for children who are terminally ill. And I bring that up as an example where nurses really can make a difference in how patients are treated and what the Board of Nursing will say in regards to medications that are being given by nurses, if appropriate scientific data and compassion and the need uh, is shown. I like the fact that you uh, emphasized entitled CO2. That's a relatively new requirement that we're just starting to invoke here. But the standard of care must be the same across the board. We can't have one group not using entitled CO2 as much as another group. So that's a work in progress here and, and really throughout the country. So I think that this has to be individualized. I think that we clearly need more definitions. As we say, we need more research because we don't really know when we're dealing with infrequent things, even if we develop, we see 12,000 kids, is that really the safety net we want or should the safety net be tightened? And the only way to tighten it is to find data. So clearly there's a lot of good work that needs to be done. But when we're called Elaine, it's really like a lot of discussion back and forth with the doctors, depending on the procedure, like LP, like you said, if it's invasive or not, and determining is it appropriate for us to do, and then, you know, what would we give, and or is the kid like autistic or, you know, really encephalopathic right now, and they're really wild in the room, and it's at least like a three or four hour process of if we do it or not, or if they end up getting anesthesia or if they really need the procedure when like ENT would like an XCT of a one or two year old and they're going to the OR anyway. So what, you know, what is the necessity? One day I got called to do two sedations and they're usually a little difficult and you don't know what their airway issues are. So it's a little scary. And then the next thing, an hour later or two later, they said, oh no, they don't need them really. They're just going to the OR. So, you know, it's a little discussion to figure out what crisis nurses have to do. Well, in fact, I think they're, they're really the soldiers, and they take care of some of the most difficult patients because we, about 10 years ago, realized that deep sedation in children really is very, it, it's, it, it's difficult and it's dangerous. So we, meaning the anesthesia division over here, became very aggressive and said, okay, we're going to do the MRIs, we're going to do the bone marrows, we're going to do the GI cases. Uh, and for kids who are difficult, who need deep sedation, we do do that. But there's a lot of kids that fall, get moderate sedation or a little moderate kind of deep sedation that are done on the floor, and that's where the safety net, I think, is so critical. Those are the kids I'm most worried about, the kids stuck in a corner in the middle of the night who need a bone marrow, and the people that are there really have all the tension on them to do it. That's that's to me, if I were to pick an area that I'm truly concerned about, where I think, although those complications may not be published that much, my suspicion is that that's the the dark space where where things occur. So so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, really, in defining the gaps in our institution and in other institutions, and really focusing in resources. I was interested in. I don't know if I've heard. 
that you said that the RSMPP actually has lower, uh, has higher risk of, of problems. Yes. That's correct mm -hmm. when they were together. Yes, when the MD and RN did uh, those groups of patients controlling for age, propofol, so ASA score, all of those, the RN only patients and the MD only patients had a significantly lower risk of adverse events than the MD and RN teams. So at that point I thought, well, maybe they're giving more propofol because I, there was a large percentage of that. So then I controlled for that and it really did not make a difference in the model. Isn't that interesting? I would love to hear from our panel members kind of what the thought on that. Yeah, I've had a lot of thoughts, but <laughs> I'm dying to hear what you guys think too. <laughs> Right, it's supposed it to be sort of like the standard. But what do you think happening there? I mean, I can say from my doctor's standpoint, they, you know, I notify I'm giving the first medicine. That's when they come in. They start prepping and draping and everything. They are so focused on what they're doing that, yes, they're in the room, but unless I or somebody says, hey, my stats are down or, hey, I need a minute, they, they don't have a clue. Um, it's until I have to, I move to get oxygen or suction or something, then their head snaps up and they're like, what are you doing? What's going on? Um, so they're in the room, but, you know, they're, my doctor at least are so focused on completing what they need to do in the sedation time we have that um, they really depend on the nurses to actually notify them of problems. That's what I'm wondering. So it was the doctor performing the procedure, so not really... Well, it was, but it was MRI, CT scan, yeah, and ultrasound, so and they, okay. none of that's them were right. interventional. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I thought of that. The other no. doing it, the other, you know, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to say that that's probably one of my next areas of research. I really, I'm thinking about the team itself and how often in radiology you have sort of some inconsistency. I really want to look at endoscopy next because I see them as basically being a team that works frequently to see what the differences might be there and then that aspect I think deserves some primary data collection about differences between maybe communication or other things that I, I don't know what they are between the MD and RN team when they're sedating versus when they're alone. That would make it different. So the data that's collected is if the MD or RN are either administering the drug or monitoring the patient, so they, that made the team. So they, that means they actually, because the way that the data is collected, it's the actual person doing that. So I don't know what the, you know, why they were in there, but if they were, then it was reflected in the data and that was considered an MD RN team. We often hear, like in critical care, some of the people that came from other places and they're and we're traveling with these patients and giving medicines and stuff. Some people say to us that it's every place that their place they came from. It's a doctor always has to go a fellow or something instead of just the nurse. Right. And maybe that was the situation. that might be the situation. The other thought that I've had from being a critical care nurse is also where they came down. We started and then things seemed to be okay, so they were there at the beginning, but then they left, that would still be counted as an MDRN team because they were there. That doesn't mean that they stayed there the entire time. So, mm -hmm. and that's one of those situations where maybe the propofol is on the pump, and there again you could say, well, you know, is the nurse really administering it? Well, it's actually kind of going. The patient is intubated. So that's the other thing. None of these patients were, you know, intubated, critical care, because that's a totally different planet as well. I don't see that as a diff that's a different situation too. And but it does kind of blow a hole into the concept of a team approach, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it does. I would, would not expect that at all. Except that we don't know if the one person doing one. I mean, that it might be just that one person doing both things, as opposed to having one person. Mm -hmm. Oh well, let me clarify. Uh, well, but you're always supposed to have two. When, if um, if you're doing a procedure uh, where you, that that proceduralist has to be different from the person who is monitoring the patient, so so that separation must occur. I think your question is, well, if you're not doing a procedure, are these people falling all over? Are they confusing their roles or doing something 
that is is making things worse. Yeah, if crisis nurses are going with two of us supporting each other and doing different tasks. And okay, I work in the adult world on a GI unit for long for years, and it was only one nurse and the surgeon. So the the doctor would give the the um the anesthesia and um, the sedation, and the nurse would monitor. And you're absolutely right. Because we are monitoring the patient, and he's so um, caught up in doing his procedure that we are the one who would tell him that something is wrong. And at that hospital, it became so so many adverse situations that they have now resorted to always have anesthesia. Sometimes the patient would practically die, rush down to ICU. So it really needs anesthesia to really monitor those patients sometimes. Well, I, I think it, it brings up the need for really, really trained people who have clearly defined roles who work very closely together. And you're talking about adults, and what I think what part of that was the use of very powerful medications, in particular propofol, where the, I mean, you're putting something in a patient's mouth, therefore how could they possibly not have a problem in their mouth? So those were high-risk patients and then they started to use high risk medications and then they got into trouble and that's where deep sedation for those type procedures really is riskier than in my opinion general anesthesia where you have a an endotracheal tube in or somebody absolutely available and ready to fix the airway if anything starts to go wrong. Um, thank you all for this great I'm just wondering in this data set Um, are they tracking at all potential adverse effects on the health of the treatment? No, and I'm dying to know about that. <laughs> I, mean, I can tell no. you anecdotally, I, I, there are some kids that I see every three to six months mm -hmm. in declines. Um, if I see their name pop up, we maxed out on our last dose. We'll try it, but they might be a failed sedate, or we've had to ramp up every time. Um, so they're developing a tolerance to the medication. Right. But I'm thinking neurocognitive, you know, with some of the new information coming out about repeated anesthesia, whether there's any effort to look at some of the latest, potential late effects. Um, the other thing that I was wondering is, is there an effort for the non-painful procedures at alternatives to sedation in terms of teaching children and you know, with reinforcing to be able to hold still for the non-painful procedures. There is actually, it's called MRI, I can do it here at this hospital. Um, radiology is lucky to have three wonderful child life ladies that they will get referrals for like, starting about the seven, eight year olds. They will send information to the parents, they will talk with the parents, this whole packet, so when the kid comes in, you know, here's what it sounds like, here's what you're going to see, experience, and, and they have a pretty good success rate um, for, you know, getting those kids, even if they've gotten sedation for MRIs in the past, to, to get to the point that they can do it without sedation. That'd and our CT, um, when they come in for CT scans, they always try to do the child without sedation first. So, we, so we've got it pretty well done in radiology and then sort of starting to think about maybe procedures that if they're managed well with a topical anesthetic and maybe some a lot of support, that could be another possibility. Um, we use child life a lot in addition yeah. to medication. Oh, yeah. with yeah. That's great. Procedures. The consortium just added child life as an additional data element because that's come up. The best way to not have adverse events is not just sedation. So that would right. be great. <laughs> And I, th I think you really brought up the two specs. One is if you don't give enough, you have post-traumatic stress disorders and how you deal with that and how you really anticipate that and help the child and the family through uh, what these frequent flyers. The other hand is here. Now we're giving all these medications. If we're talking about safety, are we indeed hurting these kids? Are we giving them a medication, especially in certain prime ages, let's say less than three years of age, where the developing brain becomes very sensitive. In fact, we're creating a group that have increased learning disabilities because of these medications. And unfortunately, all the medications which have been mentioned really do fall into this group. There are very, very few. 
other than dexmedetomidine that may not fall into this group. So that's the other side of the spectrum where we don't have good answers. Um, and, you know, we're actively looking for those solutions and these kids that need multiple procedures at very tender ages. Agreed. Thank you all. Very expert panel here. Um, I wanted to bring up two questions that are um, just thought. One is we still get called a lot about um, pain management being on the cusp of procedural sedation and people not, as Dr. Kaplan pointed out, the terminology, um, especially happens with some in the emergency room where a child will come in, they'll be in pain, but then there's some concomitant use of other adjuvants and stuff. And, and next thing you know, there's a, you know, there's diazepam being given and the nurses are starting to feel like they're doing some kind of conscious sedation or moderate sedation. That's, that's the kind of call I'll get. And they'll be like, isn't this a procedural sedation? I'm like, yeah, you're really still in the pain management world, you know? So we, we have this kind of continuum of sedation that occurs across the organization where we go from, you know, the operating room or we go into moderate sedation in other areas and then we go into the pain management realm. Or we have patients who come out of your areas, whether it be the OR or procedural areas, and people are giving other pain medications and sedatives on the unit, which sends this continuum kind of back and forth and how we're monitoring that, what tools we're using, which um, probably could be better. Um, and, and so that brings me to the question of your expertise up there, which you're all very expert and critical care prepared. And I'm wondering, um, particularly uh, after reading your paper, what is your feeling on, um, and did the consortium point out at all, the credentials of the nurse who's doing sedation and the competencies and um, where we think we're going to go in, the, in, in that. I mean, we, we may end up doing less sedation in the future world, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but if we are, are we going to start looking at competencies and critical care certifications and such for sedation nurses? I mean, there are certifications that you can get for sedation, but none of them have really any real evidence behind them, and most organizations uh, professional organizations will sort of say, you know, for you to do sedation for, um, let's say, the, um, I'm trying to think of one, like the Society of Gastroenterology Nurses, they'll have a full list of these are the things that should be included in your education. Um, so there isn't just one standard. Um, and then also, because I don't have organizational data, I can't tell you specifically that nurse, was that a radiology nurse? Is that a critical care nurse? What exactly, how, how much experience do they have? Um, I don't have that information because that's organization level. All we have really is that joint commission statement that says that the minimum requirement is that you have, you know, some training and competency and every organization meets that in a different way. I think the other thing that comes up is um, this whole, you know, like giving multiple medications. I don't know that most of us in our sedation training had any real discussion about what starts to happen when you start adding two and three drugs. Um, and so that would be an area that I think there should be more discussion with providers, at least nurse providers, about what how that increases risk. And at that point, you know, if you weren't using ETCO2 or if you are, you know, those are really the patients that have the highest risk. And do you are you aware of that? Um, I think that would be really helpful, but it's it's very difficult to find you know, like individual credentials for nurses. It's not like with the physician group on the consortium, I can see who's a pediatrician, who's an emergency department doc, who's an ICU doc. There's no specialty designated um, on the data right now. I think you, you brought up t two points I'd like to emphasize. One is the assessment of the individual patient, because here we are giving all these multiple drugs, and then we throw in pain drugs over here, and then the procedure's over, and now they're at the floor, and you may have these drugs peaking, or they may be back to their chronic pain needs, so you're adding the, these different medications, and there is no dose which seems to, we can say at this dose, you know, X you need, you're deeply sedated at this dose, you're in pain at this dose, and therefore you should increase. So the assessment becomes absolutely important. And the person who's on the front line, how this person is responding to voice, how they're responding to a painful stimulus, what their ventilation oxygenation is, really di dictates what level they're in as opposed to the, the drug or the type of drugs. And that's something that we need to improve on because that frontline assessment must drive the appropriate care 
Uh, so that so that and the frontline nurse is absolutely important on that, especially after the procedure is done and everybody else has left and you're there taking care of the kid. I think the other the other point was that the joint uh, which has to do with um, competencies is joint commission has some mandates that we have to do and they basically say guys just and ladies just write it down as long as you write down a policy and you follow it it's okay it's up to the individual institutions to create these policies there are some national guidelines that you mentioned but it really is up to the individual places and we for years have been working on a special what we feel is a reasonable approach in our institution of making sure that you have a certain either BLS or PAL certification, that you take our uh, standardized quiz that we have in our checks course, and that also the person who's your direct leader signs off that says that in their opinion they feel that you're competent to perform or be uh, either administer or monitor sedation. But every place is different and we do need national guidelines. They should be the equivalent of a sedation PALS. There's no reason why there's not a national certification that says yes, you have done this. Now, will it make a difference? I have no idea. But we do it for PALS and we do it for BLS. Why doesn't somebody do it for sedation? Why don't people come up with standardized training sessions and mannequins and simulations and go across the board and say, if you're going to give pediatric sedation, this is the qualifications. We're going to give you a certification and this is what you've done. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And also remember that a lot of those patients are going home. Right? So they're being discharged to a parent. And there's not a lot of good um, research in that area, too. I mean, most places do callbacks. But then, you know, do you really find out the ones that had to go back to the hospital the following day because they were still sleepy or they were vomiting or doing any of those things? So for those patients that are ambulatory, that's one area also the consortium doesn't capture that. So I want to probably make one of the last questions and then thank um, our panelists. Um, it's been outstanding. Um, I feel like it's kind of cutting edge in terms of the discussion. Um, I wondered, uh, Dr. Krigo, if you, I'm sure you probably gave some consideration to looking at the team with the drugs. Could you actually do some comparison and say if you had to make a recommendation, these are the areas where if you're not in a major center that's paying attention to this? if you were to recommend something to a board of nursing? I mean, I think one of the major points does go back to the fact that probably what's in the consortium is the gold standard. So there does need to be like this separate sort of data collection that happens to really find out about the community hospitals and other places that have less of an expertise because those are most likely to be the ones that are more at risk, you know, yeah, of, of higher risk. And until that happens, we, and again, we don't know anything about adults. There's nothing like this for adult sedation. In the okay. there, there is no consortium. There is no anything. So that's a pretty big population as well. Um, and that is a major gap in order for the regulatory agencies to do this. So I think it'll take somebody like NCSBN, that big organization that sponsored, for example, the study on simulation that we just that they just did with uh, three different groups, to do something like that. I mean, there has to be somebody who really does something at that level that's interested in nursing that would be able to get the membership and the interest to be able to do it. And I think your point about the community hospital is that when we build a safety net, who's going to fall through that safety net and where is it going to occur? And as a nurse, I would suggest that in those community hospitals, you're going to have to do more and more on more difficult kids, and you're not going to have the support that we have support here. So I do think that you're right. That's really, the, to me, that's where the, the safety net needs to be tightened. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you too. I remember you uh -huh. from yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, how are you doing? How are you? Hi, how are you? Oh, nice to meet you too. I really like that. Oh, I like it. How's it going? Oh, how sweet of you guys. Oh, thank you. Good. I really like it. It's great. So I have just a, a couple of closing remarks. Um, I want to thank you all for um, staying with us to the end of the day. Um, I think it's been a great day. Um, I'm sure that you're feeling a little weary. 
Um, but I hope you'll take what you learned um, today. Um, and our overall goal for the program was, again, kind of to tackle those issues around um, the quality chasm gap and taking the, um, the current research findings and translating them into our routine practices of care. Um, I want to make certain that no one has any questions about what to do with their continuing education form. It's right next door. We thought we'd make it easier and centralized. You just go right next door um, to um, turn those in. And if you're on the web, again, uh, if there's any questions, contact um, Eileen Eng or Kathy Dubois um, for instructions. We'll make certain that um, if we um, omitted something, we'll work that out. And then I would hope that um, in your roving conversations that you've had a chance today to provide us feedback with things that you'd like to see. Um, I think this is our second annual Nursing Research Day. And um, I think that we had enough content, we could have built a program for two days. Um, I want to thank our speakers who came from a distance, Dr. Krieko, um and Dr. Frank. And I want to make special recognition to Dr. Fida who's in the audience, and then a very special um, heartfelt thanks to our planning committee members. I think the Poster Cafe um, was a huge success. Um, and I, again, I hope you'll take uh, some popcorn and have a chance to um, have some dialogue. And um, beyond that, I just hope that you'll share what you learned um, with your colleagues. I know that not everybody can get off the unit. But if you'll encourage them um, when we do it, we'd like to see this um, day and program grow. And thank you. <laughs>